Several of our recent interviews have stressed the importance of place, of a human being's relationship to a particular location, with a comprehensive understanding of its plants and animals, its seasons, its food webs, in the deepest sense, its character. Gary Saunders grew up in Outport, Newfoundland, the son of a riverman, completely at home in the woods. He spent most of his adult life in Nova Scotia as a forester, an artist, an educator, and a writer in the tradition of Thoreau and Aldo Leopold. His most recent book is the award-winning My Life with Trees, a unique memoir of 30 chapters, each focused on a particular species of tree and on his memories of people associated with that tree. The book is illustrated with Gary's own paintings and drawings. It seamlessly blends science and memory in graceful and resonant prose and beautifully illustrates the depth of Gary's understanding not only from his own scholarship and observation, but also from the indigenous people around him. He's very conscious of his own position in time. Talk about the word book, for example, and he'll tell you about the Norse ancestry of that word, which is, of course, associated with a tree. This is a man who profoundly understands what he calls reading the fingerprints of place. I want to start with, I guess I want to start with who is Gary Saunders, and I, but I want to come eventually back to this beautiful book that's just won the Evelyn Richardson Award. Um, but you've got a long history in a whole range of disciplines, scientific, artistic, and so on and so forth. And you started in a small community in a fairly basic corner of Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. How did you get from there to here? I think the forester came because my father was a woodsman and a riverman and missed the river. When they were in New York in 27, they got married, my mother, in, uh, and he in New York in 27. And then they went to Buffalo and drove, he drove streetcar and plows and stuff. And they, I think just pined for Newfoundland, especially he, him. My mother was from Fogo, so it was a fishing community, but he was from the woods, you know, the river and the woods. And so I thought I'd be a trapper and a riverman too. When I was 10, I was sure, you know, I would. And I listened to the stories at night, you know, they'd come in and talk to dad about what, old, old people who couldn't do it anymore would t ask about What's the caribou like? Is there any sign of link, link they call it, lynx, mm -hmm. and river otter, and so on. And I'd hear all that. And uh, then I realized I, I can't be a, a river man. My mother wouldn't allow me anyway. She said, you, you don't want, you want to be coming home, you know, smelling a muskrat and, and wood smoke with your holes burned in your mitts and all that kind of stuff. I mean, she loved him, but she didn't love the river, not as much. She, she was more, she liked New York. And so I, when I realized from moving back and forth that we, the river was fading farther away, um, and then there came a scholarship. The government realized from a Norwegian forester, he said, you have no native-born foresters. You should get a scholarship up and pick people who look you know, likely and uh, let people know about it and then pick out uh, some young students. So I was one of them. And I think that's the connection, woods, woods, you know. And I thought it would be woods all the time. When I got to be a forester, it would be woods. But <laughs> my real bent was for education. Uh, you know, anything I found out, I wanted to tell someone. And, and, and I wanted to write about it so I could understand it. And so I was in Lewisport, regional forester from northeast corner of Newfoundland to, you know, the northern peninsula, big area. But and uh, when I came to Gander Bay to set up cutting areas, I thought, I'm going to be telling my uncle where to cut. And that's not going to work very well. <laughs> you know, you can't cut there because it's overcut. And then I'd be told by the supervisor, I was a forester, but he was a supervisor, go out to Trinity and give that guy a mark on a block of land for that guy because he has, he's a merchant and he controlled 50 votes, liberal votes. That came from St. John's, you know, the instruction. Don't give that guy. So I would go do it, and I thought, I don't like this. Uh, so I started writing articles for the Evening Telegram on forestry because nobody understood what we were trying to do. And I thought, we've got to back up about 20 paces and do this education and then come to talk about management and overcutting and undercutting. By then, most communities had cut the tree, the firewood, back, you know, a kilometer or so. You had to go in the winter to get wood big enough on the three mile limit, they call it. It's a coastal community forest they used to have all around Newfoundland. 
Oh, really? Yeah, they had, yeah. it was a three mile limit, a three mile from the bottom of the bays, you know, it snaked around all the way around. It was crown land, all of it was crown land and you could cut on it free. Mm -hmm. Not a bad idea. No. But idea. you had to keep records. Mm -hmm. So you'd go around to get the records, you know. Do, do you remember signing something and how much you were going to cut? Oh yeah, I think my wife put that in. Yeah, I think that's in a jug up in the bedroom. Yeah, it is. So he'd go up and get it and give it to us and that's, but they kind of be cursing under their breath, you know, <laughs> be damned. One guy said, bunch of Nazis, he said, when we were talking to a group of forestry people. And I felt, as a native, you know, native born, I felt bad. I didn't want to do that, but I wanted to do education. And I was already writing a bit. I had a teacher in grade 10, no, grade 11, who really encouraged me to write. One of those, you know. Mm -hmm. and, I, and we had a book, Mastering Effective English, which had excerpts from all kinds of great writers. It's a great textbook. We had that textbook too. Green. Yeah. And yeah. you know, the elements of gra grammar, uh, you know, the parts of the sentence, all, yeah. it was all in there. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. book. It was. It Ooh. was. I remember it. <laughs> yeah, we oh, had yeah. it too. I think it was from Toronto, maybe, across it in Dunlap or yeah. Mac, Mac, Mac somebody. Macmillan? Macmillan? Yeah, could yeah, have been. It was Canadian. Yeah. I yeah. wasn't, but it was. <laughs> That's right. You were pre I was when I was in grade 11. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think that's how, and to answer it in the longest possible way, that's how I, you know, the second next best thing to be a forester. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know I'd end up in the office, but I was doing education mostly. Well, you were actually doing trapping and woods work when you were, you know, yeah. pre-teen almost, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 We were learning the lore. Yeah. You know, you go and catch a weasel. That was a big deal. Yeah. I know how to do it, you know. You hang the bait and you have a cavity and you hang the bait and it has to step on the trap to get the bait. Yeah. And same, I never trapped otter, you know, or anything, but I knew the principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You come home with a muskrat or something. Muskrat is delicious. All right. Oh yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's as good as duck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we didn't catch it for that, but you wouldn't throw away the carcass. The carcass. You, mean no. you wouldn't just take the fur. And rabbits, of course. Before that, when you were small, smaller, younger. Always, every Saturday almost in the winter, you had 22, single shot, and snares, and you wouldn't look at your snares, Everett and I, or Everett and Frank and I, they were cousins, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. So, was, uh, so then it's, an, it's kind of a natural growth, if you're not going to actually be in the woods doing that kind of work, yeah. then, but you're going to be of the woods and around yeah. the woods and, ex yeah. and studying the woods. And it was all around you, literally. You, yeah. You could, yeah. Well, as I said in the introduction, you could walk for, you know, you walk for days actually and be always in forest forest land if not forest you know bogs and barrens and forest forest yeah a boreal forest not great but that's all we knew could you do it then could you do it now how much of that is left uh you walk through a lot of cutovers but they're coming back yeah i haven't thought about it much but uh yeah it's newfoundland is not very much developed interior mm. you know you have grand falls and you have corner brook two paper mills, which are, and Gander, and so on, but, and the road, and the railroad, which is no, no more. But vast areas of wilderness all around that. To me, one of the interesting things that you're, you're telling me, too, is you say you also get into writing to understand. Yes. Tell me about that, because I think that's, that's more, like more um, I've seen that happen, I've experienced that happening, and it's, I think it's a real impulse for a I lot of people. I don't know if it was Einstein. Someone said that if you don't understand it, you can't write it. And that any topic, no matter how complex, nuclear physics, can be written in a way that's understandable by most people. I think, I didn't realize this, when the book came out, I had forgotten, but later I came through some notes, and here was the note about Primo Levi, Levi, mm -hmm. who wrote a book called Uncle Tungsten. He took all the elements, his parents were chemists, both of them. He grew up with chemistry. And you know, all the zinc is so different from lead, from copper, and so on, and so on. So he, th he thought he'd write a kind of lay person's version of chemistry. I wish I'd had it in Chemistry 100, because I never took it in high school, and I had to take it in university, and it was hard, you know. I wasn't getting it until two thirds through. But this book, Uncle Tungsten, takes all the elements and treats them with personality. The kind of, you know, zinc is 
uh, manganese, very reactive, oxidizes easily, catches fire, you know. And he had an uncle like that, and an aunt like the other, and he matched up his relatives with, with chemical elements, basic, you know, things like copper. And I, I read that, and made notes, and I really liked it, but this was about seven or eight years ago. But looking back, that's where I got the idea to personalize trees uh, during my rewrite, during the final edit. Before that, they were each written about three a month as profiles of our native Atlantic area trees. That's how they came about. I wrote Dirk Van Loon, I said, what do you think of a series on trees, like profiles? But not just, you know, how to identify and what they're good for, but stories. Oh my. He came back with a card, he said, bizarre, Gary, because I've been dealing with them since 76 when they started writing essays. Bizarre, he said, I was just thinking something the same. Maybe 500 words, he said. First one I sent in was 1,500 words. And they never went much under that, but he took them anyway in, in Atlantic Forestry magazine, which was a new magazine 18 years ago. That's why I sent the proposal. I sent it because I was missing education, my work in education, which was about interpreting, explaining, connecting students, teachers, and our various publics, trappers, Christmas tree growers. We had all these publics, you know, that, that were, were my clientele at work. We had a magazine, Wildlife Magazine. We had a four, Woodlot Owners Magazine, Forest Times, where we had, one was a quarterly, one was bi-monthly. We had 12,000 readers for Amos Conservation. Bob Bancroft wrote for it, and Neil Van Ostrand and all these guys, and I was the editor. So I did a lot of editing too. Anyway, Uncle Tungsten and, and, and those articles and, and Dirk's response made the book happen. But I didn't think about it until about two years ago and I thought, my God, I'm 79 years old. I'm almost 79. What's gonna to happen to all my articles, essays in the computer? My kids, you know, I have six kids, but they're not gonna take, oh my goodness, we have to do something with this and I don't want them to have to do that. Why don't I? bring them together somehow and make a proposal. And that way, not that, you know, the world is holding its breath for them, but I learned a lot. I, I understand, you know, a lot more about red pine after I finished the article than I did before. Some of it I had forgotten, but some of it I never learned about it. Like for instance, right now, I just learned on this hike, chaga is a black sooty material, the best antioxidant, ox, oxen, is it? No. Oxidant. Oxidant. Yeah for against cancer that they've, one of the best they've found, probably better than blueberries. It's just a nasty looking black thing that grows on birch, yellow birch and white birch. I didn't know about that. How could I miss that? Well, how would you know it? Well, I should have seen it and said, well, what's that thing there? Oh, I see, yeah. So you hadn't really noticed. noticed the phenomenon. Never, no. Yeah, never, never you know, mind. Never and the branch works. comes out of a birch and it has a wave, like a, the, wake, the wake of a boat, eh? because the wood is growing against this up-angled branch, and you get this trail, this wake of, of, of callus tissue that's more or less black on a white birch, not so obvious on a yellow birch. Uh, I thought, I knew that, and I thought, well, that, is that chaga? No, it's not. This thing is a fungus that grows in cracks, I guess, or whatever. It's like black knot on a cherry, and it grows on birches mostly, but not only. And in the Orient, they've known about it for thousands of years. Yeah. It's good for the immune system. That's how it works against cancer. It boosts your immune system. How, do you, how would you take it? In, how would you take it? In what form would you As ingest a tea. it? As a tea. It's the main principal way that the, the Asians take it. You grind it up in a coffee grinder or something. It's very hard. Uh, hard to scrape off and so on. So the rest of the hike, I look for it. You know, here and there up on Cape Sharp not a good birch area and I thought I found it once but anyway still learning you know yeah 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 there's lots to know well and you're you're right that the whole process of writing forces you to, to learn and to and to organize your learning in a systematic kind of way so yes. that you learn more out of you get more out of it yes and then and of course you can't think about any topic close to home without thinking of people you know, I remember the time that so and so, the one about red maple in my book. I remember that quite well. I said, oh, Dad, look, look at this. I was coming home from university, going down the river with him to Gander Bay. 
look at this. I said, this is not supposed to grow here. That's a red maple. No, my son, that's not a red maple. Okay, what is it? He said, that's a sycamore. <laughs> sycamore doesn't grow in Canada. It does grow in southern New England. I know it. It has peeling bark that looks like sunburned skin falling off. The bark is gray, and then these cream areas are cur curling off. The bark's calling a very thin bark, something like a, uh, something like a white birch would shed its bark, mm -hmm. but not yes. not in uh, curls, but in uh, tatters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, it couldn't. I said no, it couldn't be sycamore. There's no sycamore here. But he was right in a way. That's what they call it because back in England, they had. Uh, no red maple, but they had sycamore. They also had a, map a maple that had a leaf like sycamore, so they called it sycamore maple <laughs> in English. <laughs> so it's complicated, you know. Yeah. He was right. He was doubly right, and I was, you know, I wasn't wrong. It was semantics. But what, I was going to say it was a red maple. Though, yes, right? yeah. it was a soft or red or a swamp maple. Yeah. yeah, and rather rare in Newfoundland. The common one is mountain maple. They look the same at a distance because they both turn red, but one has a five, pet, a five lobe leaf and the other has a three, you know, more or less three. And, and so that was semantics, but it was language. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that, that I think is just absolutely charming about, about your book is it begins with a little introduction which is at one level scientific. You, you know, we, we know the scientific name of it. We know what it, we, you tell us what the range is, how long it lives, uh, and all that kind oh, of yeah, stuff. Oh, the little box at the top. Yeah. That's how I shortened the book. It had to be shortened 30%. Oh, yeah? A month before I you know, <laughs> submission. I think it was about a month and a half. He said, are you up for that? And Steve said, we love it. He said, we like the material, but it's too long. He said, it'll be a big, thick book. We can't afford it. To print it, we wouldn't be able. People wouldn't buy it because it's too expensive. So, could you shorten it thirty percent? That's a rewrite. Yeah, I sure thought is. first. You know, that's a rewrite. You can't just. And if you write well, you can't take a chunk out. You have to make a bridge there, or something, or a suture, or something, or graft. <laughs> I said, give me a week. Then I thought, I can't give up now. I've come this far with it. I got to do it. How can I do? It? So I figured out a way. You know. And that was one way. Take a chunk, take all that out of there, and put it in a little tiny, in eight-point type at the top. What to look for? And then that freed me up to. And that's kind of the nub of what you, of the character of the, of it's going to be the the tree of that yeah. chapter, right? Yeah. What are, what are sylvics? I mean, you've, you've it is the, you might say the personality of trees, how they live and how they interact with the ecosystem. Maybe one likes down. to uh, sugar maple. Won't grow out in the open. The seedlings, the seedlings, you always see them right under, in very deep shade actually, among all the flowers, the spring flower. They get some sun in the spring before the leaves come out. They might have a few weeks of sun and then it shades over. It's green lights. It's probably good for growing. I don't know. But I mean, it's green, milky light from the new leaves of the tree, mother tree, father tree. And others can't grow that way at all. White spruce does best in an old field that's abandoned, acidic, work to death, love that, in the grass. Come up in the grass, it's prickly, nothing likes to eat it, nothing much. A rabbit won't touch it, a mouse, you know, it's prickly and it stinks too. You know, cat spruce, it smells of cat, it's catty, cat spruce, <laughs> or pasture spruce. So that's how it grows, so that's two different, totally different ways to colonize or to grow in a, in a niche. So Sylvix so is more or less like the context that that tree likes. Yes. Right? It's more or less that well, box. What's in yeah. the box is the Sylvix of yeah. the tree, the personality yeah. or the need or the uh, way it copes, you know? Yeah. Now, there's a book by a German forester, sort of a wolf something, it's now translated called The Hidden Life of Trees. Very, the concept is similar to my book except that I didn't know most of this stuff, that beech trees, like in a European beech forest, the ones that aren't doing very well are helped by the ones that are doing well through root contact and, and, and fungal, fungal contact, mycorrhizae, that, that the tree needs anyway. And they can go for miles or kilometers, mycorrhizae, 
you know, linking one to the other, to the other, to the other. They go on for long distances. So the whole stand, the community, is looking after its weaker members. And of course, the, the young trees, like sugar maple, American beech is a very shade tolerant tree, another one, mm -hmm. that won't grow very well in the sun. A little bit of sun in the spring, but other than that, it does fine. Of waiting for something to open. And that one over there, Uncle So-and-so, falls over. If it happens to be facing south, it's got lots of light. Then it shoots up. Yeah. That, now, that's fascinating, because that's that, really... That's a, yeah, okay. Because that's a, that's a theme that's really only emerged in forestry in fairly recent times, is that the trees oh, do... Oh, that the latest, what I'm talking about, yeah. is communication of trees. They had known that trees know that a forest fire is coming by the chemistry of the air and let each other know downwind. Um, or that there's an infestation of some insect coming, apparently. I don't know if they smell it or, or what, but they pick it up and kind of brace each other for it, apparently. I knew that. That's about 10 years ago. But this is much beyond that. He calls it the hidden life of trees. And uh, There's a professor at UBC, Suzanne Samard, who's done a bunch of work on this. And, and one of the things that she talks about is, is how through the, the fungal relationships of the roots, the, the, this, this sort of cooperation runs across species. That's what I wondered about. I haven't read the book yet. I just ordered it and just got it. Yeah. I wondered if it happens between species. No, we're into something there. Well, yeah, and, and the, the uh, nutrients that the taller trees derive from sunlight, they will share yes. with, uh, with other species which need them because they're held in the shade. That, yes, that kind of and, thing. and that right? species may be returning the favor some other way. In some other way, yeah. Nutrients yeah. Or, or whatever, yeah. Uh, that's true. That happens. Now this makes a fascinating point that I think very few people understand that a forest is not just a collection of trees. No. What's a forest? It's an ecosystem. And an old growth hemlock stand with white pine is an ecosystem that gets along very well, you know. Hemlock is very shade tolerant. White pine is not so. It'll stand some, but not very much. You have to open it to get regeneration. Which is why, you know, when I was taking teachers to Point Pleasant Park, I talked to the, the guy, the manager, and I said, why don't you cut a little? I mean, you've got, you've got no regen at all. There's no, you're not going to have a, a pine hemlock forest 50 years down the road. You're going to have fir and stuff that come in. As these trees die, the aggressive ones like white spruce and fir will come in. He said, we're not allowed to cut anything other than dangerous branches or trees that are starting to go. Too bad, I said, you know, because this happened because of a hurricane, probably. Probably the hurricane in 1790, you know, or, or maybe Saxby Gale, 1869, made that happen, made this happen. First, the white pine, it likes sandy. If it's sandy, it does very well. The hemlock comes in later because it's shaded. It wouldn't come in without that. But the, together, they work well together. I, mean, I don't know how many other ways they work together. But the traffic, human traffic, with dogs and feet going everywhere, you know, anything that did manage to grow in a little pocket of light was, was talk. There was nothing growing in there, except along the roadsides. There you have white pine. White pine, not hemlock, because it, was, wasn't, it, was, it wasn't that shady. But they were, you know, anywhere along there. Same with the United Church camp down in Middleton? Where is it? In the valley, anyway. They had the same thing, and they had all kinds of Half the cottages were damaged by, by white pine, big pines and hemlock coming down on the roofs of cottages when they got too old, you know, lately, about two or three years ago. You, you just remarked on, on, on the, you looked at the tree and you saw a story, you saw, yeah. you saw a history, you saw a kind of a, I don't know, I'd say a heroic, but you've got a single tree standing there, yeah. strong all very by sturdy. itself, very yeah. sturdy, uh, very durable. And, uh, and I think one of the things that charmed me about that was that I, th I suspect that anybody who drives that highway regularly I think sees my wife that remembers tree. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, without my mentioning it. Yeah. yeah. So tell me what, we know, what you know about that tree. <laughs> Not very much. I <laughs> went down and I said I talked to it, you know. Well, I listened to it. I just wondered, you know, uh, where it came from, how it got to be there. Did some wise farmer say, my cows are, you know, getting sunburned, so I better leave one. And maybe there was a stand there. So I, I just thought for the tree. I guess I thought with the tree, you know, how did you get here? 
what, what, are, what were you when I left the fence up by the highway to walk down? It was a little farther than I thought. What are you? And I thought, it was going down, it had the oak look. It could be white or, or red. And when I got there, it was red. It's very sturdy. Uh, and I mentioned the Hallmark study years ago. I always remember that in the 50s, I think. They did a study to see what's the favorite image for a card that would appeal to more, most people. It was a, a lone tree on a hilltop in the wind or, you know, battered by life. <laughs> and this one looks very sturdy and, and healthy. And there are also tight relationships between species of animals and species of trees, right? There's a whole community, community yes. there too, right? The, there's one bird that preys on the jack pine sawfly, Kirtland warbler, and especially in, well, where it's pure stands. Ours are pure stands, you know, a little bit in New Brunswick and more in Ontario and so on, but they're not really. But real big stands of jack pine, the Kirtland warbler is crucial to eat this sawfly, the larva, larvae there. So that's one example. It's just a little bird this big. One bird can't do very much, but you know, a flock of birds traveling, constantly moving around, like chickadees you see here in our boreal, subboreal forest. You know, you see. What do they do for a living? They scour the bark, like you see the other day. I heard, psh, 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 you know, you know they're there, and then there's one. Oh, there's another one. There's another one. It's a family that feeds here in the winter on the seed, probably. They scour the apple tree under the, you know, picking, picking little tiny beak, you know, picking that that flake of, and underneath there's an insect egg or larva, eggs mostly. That's what they do. They 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 clean house. <laughs> And it's then serve the apple tree in doing so. Oh yeah, I mean it doesn't. It can handle uh, mild defoliation, but if it had a real build up, you know, a couple of years of that would kill it. Most trees can handle, you know, uh, say losing two thirds of its foliage, unless they're sick already. But a healthy tree can stand that. But uh, yeah, and uh, this is more the benefit of the bird, I suppose. But the sap sucker, so called, it doesn't suck the sap. It sucks the insects that are in the sap. Insects come and get embedded. Ants are always, you climb a tree and there's always ants in the summer. Things going on, ants going up, ants going down, carrying this and carrying that. But they come to this sugary syrup, the sap that's coming out of the apple tree or palm tree or cherry tree, and it gets stuck. The woodpecker or the sap sucker makes it get stuck. Like it drills a hole about a centimeter across, and another one here, and another one here. They're usually in a line. You'll see them, eh? And the sap comes out in this one first. Maybe it comes back next week. I don't know. But it returns to these, these uh, oases, you know, to, to, to get the insects and the sap, probably. But so it's almost like trapping the insects, right? Yeah. Setting a trap for yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, you know, bird brain. <laughs> don't talk about bird brain. <laughs> Can you navigate without GPS or anything from, from, from Cuba to Cape Breton? <laughs> Never having been there before, maybe, but you've got a grandmother ahead of you that can, a little bird like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah this is spectacular stuff when you start to look at what actually goes on there. And, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and we have been so arrogant. Uh, yeah. We have been so arrogant as human yes. beings here. Yes. Yeah. They're just the different intelligence. And now we're thinking about trees, too. What is intelligence? Coping with your habitat and your tenants and your enemies, so-called. They're not enemies, really. I mean, mountain pine beetle, beetle in BC and, uh, and Alberta is only converting it to compost, really. I mean, it's a benefit of the forest, but not to the industry. Now they're finding, I read it in the Atlantic Forestry, I'm glad to hear it, tree. I've heard several people say, my goodness, the vegetation seems to be more lush lately. My potato stalks are, I wonder if there's any potatoes down there because they're so tall this year. The, the extra CO2 in the atmosphere is now, the plants are responding to that, it's easier. There's more CO2, there's more carbon in the air. Never was much, but there's a little bit more. And apparently, up there in Alberta and Ontario, those trees are coming back faster, the young ones. Than, than they expected. Yeah, they're growing faster, which takes up more CO2 out of the atmosphere. The very thing that, that the beetle caused, you might say, or, or 
lack of harvesting cost is being counteracted, rebalanced somehow. Well, this takes you back to the Gaia theory, doesn't it? The, yeah. yeah the that there is this living thing. And Daisy world. Yeah. Daisy yeah, world. that's yeah. right. That's right. It gets too, what was it? it? gets too hot. You get, he just used that for an yeah. example. You get all, suddenly there's, you know, fields of daisies, white, which reflects sunlight, which cools things down, which makes it better for the next flower that doesn't like it so hot. That's just... Yeah, exactly. that, that's right. That, yeah, yeah. But it was fascinating that it's just self self adjusting, yeah. and there's so many examples of that. But yeah. that's a spectacular one, isn't it? Another one recently is bacteria communicate. You don't think that they don't believe that, but when they get you know, there's no point in subdividing without the perfect food supply and the good habitat and all that. But apparently, when they get to a critical mass, you know, several thousand maybe, just a tiny, tiny spot of bacteria, they send a signal, hey, things are good here, um, t to each other and to others, colonies, and then they start dividing faster, or dividing, dividing. And, and you know, in 20 minutes, a whole bacteria can, can have a whole generation in 20 minutes, and start over again. And same in our bowels, now they're saying that, you know, you give you a infusion of bacteria for bowel problems because your bowel a bacteria are not happy either your diet or an illness or your immune system is not working right but if you you don't take out what's there you're just putting what should be there and they overpower the ones that are gone sour you might say and you feel good again now you know they even say maybe your thoughts how you feel and <laughs> are almost engineered by bacteria Oh, really? 50% of our cells are bacteria. They're not our own cells. They're hitchhikers. <laughs> and, of course, trees have all those mycorrhizae, all different kinds of fungi, that up to 90% of the soil, what we call dirt, is alive. The rest of it is uh, mineral granules, sand, clay, and muck. But, but in a healthy soil, it's mostly living material. Wow. Yeah. wow. Yeah. So you can imagine what happens when you put Roundup to it. Yes. Yeah. They say, I don't think they even measure for that. They measure mice to see if they mind, as if mice were well, we mice, we mice, mammals. But yeah, mice are mammals, so they count. Yeah, so right? they count. <laughs> yeah. But we're not mice. We're orangutans or chimpanzees. 98% eh? the same DNA in a chimp as in you and me and you. So... Yeah, all that is very, and it helps to write because you find out something and you process it through writing, for me, or telling, talking, with a black, you know, up in front of a class, as well as you can understand it. And the teachers we remember best are ones that could tell stories, I think. Uh, I mean, to interpret something in a, in a story, rather than just say, this is it, this is it. That's a very interesting phenomenon, that the story is our, the way we learn. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, the most and powerful is, way to learn. Is language innate? That's a big question, I eh? still. Chomsky said we were wired for language. And then now there's a generation saying, no, that's, that's, that's hogwash. Mm -hmm. You know, that we get a, a laborious, to, uh, you know, some creatures, a chimp can't, get his tongue and palate around the words we can say. You can laugh. A chimp laughs just like us, you know, pretty much. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, we laugh like a chimp, I should say. <laughs> That's right. That's more. But, That's yeah, more. who knows? But language, and the fascinating thing about language is, if you, I, I know only, only two languages, they're one and a half, English and Newfoundland English. <laughs> but if I knew French, or the little bit I know, or Latin, or Spanish, I took a year of Spanish. They think differently in that language. Yeah, what? my my son, when he was five, we took him to France, and and he suddenly had that revelation, and he didn't, and he didn't know how quite to express it. But I think he did a brilliant job. He said, "Dad," he said, "When a Frenchman says we, oui, he doesn't mean yes; he means we." Oui. 
<laughs> That's a very, you know, very first thing someone would notice. It's profound, isn't it? Yeah, it though? sounds yeah. exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, beyond that, the way of approaching the story is different. The language I'd love to know is Mi'kmaq. And yeah. I know that is a very different worldview, and yeah. it's a very, uh, and I, the project we've been working on, the, the law project, one of our finest sources, who's in the book, John Boros, is a, a Anishinaabe from Ontario. And he points out that it's in the, in the common law system, uh, the authority over land derives from the crown. So the, 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 the land is conceived of as originally belonging to the crown, and then it's, it's conferred upon various people and, and then passed on along. So it's property, right? But in the, uh, in the First Nations view of the matter, the land is a gift of the Creator. It's not something that belonged to the crown. Nobody. And so yeah, everything yeah. about it is sacred. You can't sell it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a really different worldview, oh, yes. but it's a much more survivable, it's a much more sustainable worldview. Yes, yeah. And the language apparently is full of metaphor, you know, natural metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard a story about Inu, people way back, not Inu, uh, in a wit, showing a photograph, couldn't get it. Doesn't mean anything to, couldn't read it. Didn't even recognize their wife there, you know. Um, um, but they loved music. And the Moravians brought music to them in Labrador. And the word they had was black box that tinkles. That was the literal word Pass, uh, descriptor for the t piano or whatever it was that had keyboard anyway yeah black box that tinkles pretty good it is and it's yeah. all there let me so, come okay sorry go yeah, ahead. well Mi'kmaq you know would, all of their words for places and things would be like that I think yes and, and apparently the language is verb based so that it's oh. it's it's all it's it's about action not about static oh. things like nouns are static but okay. verbs are moving and so then you get things like this would, there's a word that would mean chair, yeah. but it would also mean a rock if you happen to be on the seashore or a stump if you're in it's the forest. It's a sitting place. It's, it's, a sit, it's a, something to sit on, yeah. 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 But I think uh, you, would, you would see the world extremely, in a, in a really fascinating way if you knew a language as different as that. So it's almost a whole sentence in that. I mean, it takes a sentence, but it's one word, one mm -hmm. sound. Uh, I'm reading uh, Annie Prue's Barkskins. Yeah, she's having Mi'kmaq. It starts out west, but it's now in, before the middle of the book, I'm into Nova Scotia. And, and, and uh, uh, people in crisis. The Mi'kmaq, the old way, the young ones are saying, the old way doesn't work, Grandma. We, we have to learn white man way, we have to learn the words, and, and then her and cut timber, so they're working cutting timber. But, but when, when she has them speak, Mi'kmaq in English, it's, it's fair, I think it's well done. Black box just tinkles, she does that in their English. They're talking Mi'kmaq, I think. They're, not, they're talking to each other. But she uses these very childlike sentences, me not like here. Now, we, we make fun of that in Lone Ranger, eh? Mm -hmm. The comic books, you know, it's in Tonto's dumb, eh? He says, me not like that. But that's how what you we would do worse than that trying to speak Hebrew or Mi'kmaq or Mi'kmaq. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would sound childish and stupid, you know. Yeah, yeah. But she does it in a beautiful way. Oh, she's a marvelous writer. Mm -hmm. I don't think any Mi'kmaq would take offense at what she's doing with their English or their English translation. Well, another one we found out was we spoke to uh, an Anishinaabe young woman who had been working on some legal issues in Nova Scotia with the Mi'kmaq. And they discovered that they couldn't communicate in English because the way that a Mi'kmaq speaks English is different from the way an Anishinaabe yeah. uh, speaks English. And so they, and they finally found somebody who knew a bit of both languages. And then in yeah. the three versions so of three. English, they could, they could make it all kind of come together. But the way of looking at the world is, is so different that even when you speak English, that way of looking at the world comes, comes with it. Yeah. Yeah, and we don't even think of the meaning of our words much. No, no. I mean, if you look at any word that we just said, there's a whole history around it. 
book, um, Swedish beach is book, B-O-K, because they used it to write on, the bark. So it was natural to call the first books, which were slabs of beech wood, very thin, or bark, a book. Yeah. It's beech. But we just say book, you know, not realizing that it's one of the old words, too. It's one of the oldest words, book and beach. You've learned to live in a world which has all kinds of nuance. I mean, uh, you're, you're, you have a powerful sense of history, you have a powerful sense of things like the derivation of words, but you also read the, the territory around you in a way that most people aren't able to. And you convey that both through, through writing, but also through painting. Um, David Blackwood, we were classmates at Ontario College of Art. I, I went in second year. I didn't finish there. I came out to work for a couple of years, taught at Memorial, lectured in forestry to make a living. I had three kids by then. And then went back to Mount A to take the degree there. And the, trans the person who was handing out the, <laughs> the parchments said, so you finally, for, uh, kind of, finally saw the forest for the trees, eh? when I graduated. <laughs> David uh, was there, he's five years younger, from Newfoundland, was there, and we keep in touch and still do, by letter, uh, old-fashioned letter, and he said, I, I like your letters because you're a visual person. I'm not conscious of it, and when you're writing to a friend, you're not very conscious of how you do it, because you just, you know, it, they understand you. If you're writing for 10,000 people in a magazine, or 50,000 in a geographic, you have to write differently. Or as, I don't know what to call it. You have to come right back full circle, I think, and write the way you first thought it. I don't know how to describe that. To write for many is not the same as writing to a friend. You know? A friend, and that's why it's so relaxing to write to a friend. Well, in a sense, if you're writing for many, you're constantly asking yourself, what does my reader know and what does he need to know, he yes. or she need to know? Yeah. And then that structures what you're writing to. Yes, that's right. right? And, and, and usually the best way to get it, get across, get it across, is tell a story. Yes, yes. Yeah. I remember, you know, the time, or one, once upon a time, or once one time. time. <laughs> <laughs> once upon a time is one of those magic <laughs> phrases, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, Dylan Thomas has that uh, once below a time. Yes, yes. It's a lovely, was Christmas? Was it Christmas in Wales? Charles Christmas in Wales, yeah. I think, yeah. I yeah. love yeah. this stuff. Yeah, that's great. He goes beyond, um, you know. If, I, as I said to someone who asked me about writing and what I thought, I said I'd be a poet if I could, but the essay is the next best thing, because I'd be a bad poet. But sometimes I think I, I'm writing poetry. Because if you take most modern poetry now, I don't mean rhyme you know, or not rhyme or scan or you know, iambic pentameter or whatever, but it looks like diced prose. Three words here, one here, three here, ragged edge, ragged both sides, you know. But they're not saying much. That it really, if you just straighten it out and put it in prose, it's, it's not a really good sentence. It's not very lyrical, not very colorful. It's not very you know, parabolic. It doesn't take you anywhere. The bad stuff or the poor stuff. I can write that stuff. I can write better than that, I think. Well, you do all those things Poetry. in your prose. Yeah, yeah, I guess. You do. Yeah. You're not conscious yeah. of it. You know, you don't say, here I'm going to do it. No, but Robin McGraw's review of, of My Life with Trees in the, in the Telegram yes. draws a lot of attention to the, just to the texture of the way you write. Not, I love, not, yes, yeah. she w I love that. I've never met her. But she was a fan. When all her music came out, she was a fan. She really wrote a great review of that and said then, you know, this, this is a guy that writes about nature. She didn't say it then, better than Harold Horwood. He's very, he was very good, but, but not to my liking somehow. A little... Uh, not to your liking or not to hers. Not to hers either. Yeah. So she said it this time. And and she said, what did she say? Um, when I pick up a, a book that I've heard about, what I look for is that it makes me interested in something I have no interest in, have had no interest in yet. And she quoted, you know, I, I love to meet her. 
maybe we wouldn't like each other, but we keep in touch a bit on email. I thanked her for that, and I sent her a copy of all her music. Uh, uh, no, I sent her a copy of the book. But she said, when I came out on the pond with my father on the sled with the horse to go get to Cup Birch, my first time ever there, I watched the wind herd flocks of snow across the ribbed gray ice. She quoted that. She said, no metaphor there, just, you know, it's ice, it's gray, it's ribbed, and the wind, the wind is a metaphor, herding sheep, yeah. yeah. That wasn't but, a very, but that's poetry too, I guess. Well, yeah, and the thing if about I that, divided it up, eh? one line, one word, two words, four words, two words, yeah. that would be a poem, wouldn't it? It could. Could be. Carefully, carefully absor observed and, and beautifully expressed, you know. It, it, uh, yeah. Okay. And but it's f but it's from you trying very hard to say what it is that you're seeing and yeah. trying to find a, a way of giving your particular vision of that a not uncommon situation, right? And not the first draft. Mm -hmm, I'm sure. I'm you sure. know, it's probably a sixth or seventh try to get that. Yeah. Go away, think about it, or not think about it, and then it's like painting. Uh, there's a lot of commonalities there too. More with music. Painting and music are more, affin there's more affinity between them, but I put those paintings there, not to admire them, but when I wake up, I see one fresh for about 10 seconds, as if I never saw it before. That's why I have them where I can see them. Those are older sketches, studies for, for, for other paintings, larger paintings. But if it's a larger one I'm struggling with, you know, on the e easel, I want it so I can see it fresh for about 10, 15 seconds. And, and that tells me more than if I sat all day, you know, looking at it. And then I process that and think, okay, what you have to do is, you need, yeah, it's not working. Usually a painting has one really good area and the rest is not so good. But you do need that not so good to carry. In fact, you might even make it not so good, not so interesting, to carry the part that is, like the rock or the iceberg you know, keep the rest down. Um, when I was young, when I first started, I painted entirely in grays, colored grays. My favorite colors were burnt sienna, which is a red rust color, first produced in Italy, sienna probably, and ultramarine blue, which is a copper base. It's not cobalt blue, it's co I think it's, and those two together, you can warm them or you can cool them, and they make a beautiful silvery gray. And in watercolor, the copper or whatever it is, the blue flakes settle out. They flocculate or whatever you call it into the hollows of the paper and give you a speckled look, you know, which is very, which is a bonus. I've got a strange thing happening now. I've got a lot of watercolors that are never framed, you know, and there are ones that have one good spot and the rest is not so good. Mm -hmm. Some of them I cut the good spot out and put it in a binder to look at. But I've written several articles for Canadian Newfoundland Quarterly. It's a Newfoundland magazine, so I know the readership. You know, I know the readership, core readership. And I look at a painting of people picking berries. I thought, you know, I wrote about that in Free Wind Home, my, my childhood memoir, which is not doing too well. I don't know if his memoirs don't do well or that one doesn't do. It's not selling very well. And I thought, I'll see if Newfoundland Quarterly, this time I won't write something new. Uh, I'll just see if they would take that chapter. I'll adapt it and shorten it and send it in. And then I can use this painting of people picking berries for this seasonal, it would be seasonal, topical. And they loved it. So it came out and they gave me a two-page spread of two women picking back apples mm -hmm. by a pond. So the painting coming first and the writing coming after. In this case, it was rewriting. but. Now I can look at one of my paintings and say, you know, I meant I could make an article from that. That's ours backwards, isn't it? Well, it's an interesting. No, it, I, well, yes, it, it's I, not it, illustrating. No, it's already been done. Right. That's right. Well, it's illustrating with words. The thing you've done with visuals. Yeah, eh? it's a really yeah, interesting yeah. challenge. Yeah, it yeah. is. Well, and I see all of this is one of the things that, that fascinates me about Gary Saunders. When I was in, and and for me emerges very strongly from the books is that most of us, I think, kind of sleepwalk our way through the world. We see a tree, you know, it's a deciduous tree maybe, you know, or it's a, an evergreen, and that's probably as close as we come to understanding what that tree that's our companion for years and years and years in our mm -hmm. lives, right, what, what it is. 
but it seems to me that over and over again I see you saying, well, I want to really know what the lang what language is. I want to know what the books, what the, the words mean. I want to know the tree. I want to know the birds. And then you also want to know it in time. Um, and so we've, you've got a, a chapter about extinctions, for example, which, yeah. which goes back into the time. The afterword, I think. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, the, the ones who are with us no more kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and the whole process is one of really understanding who you are and where you are, in, and it's very particular. One of the things that seems to emerge for us in, in a lot of the interviews we do is that one of the core um, things that makes people value this world is understanding in detail the particular place that they're in. And I don't know anybody who does that more comprehensively than you do. Well, I, you know, I walk by things without noticing them. But fewer than most of us, I think. Well, I try, keep trying to not be like that, you know. But I had a bout of prostate cancer. I had the operation. I had seven-hour operation, transfusion, and all that, and came home and no, don't lift anything heavy. Don't lift a thick book even. Not even. Don't lift your cat. So we can't lift anything. And out in the country, I'm always lifting stuff, eh? Firewood and everything. This was... In June, I think I had it. I spent a lot of time watching spiders mating, and this and that, you know, and that reminded me of being a child, where everything is new. Before you can express it, even, you, you know, um, I think that was good. <laughs> you know, it was good in a way. It stopped me, and I was retired by then. And I was going to forestry school. It was pretty dull in places and was pretty hard. Statistics, mensuration, things that I, I'm okay at math, but I have to work at it. Yeah, I'm not a mathematician. Uh, calculus, you know, we had to take that in second year. The mathematics of rates, right? How fast will the narrowing bottle fill? Things like that, eh? Uh, almost like using algebra and, uh, anyway. Uh, I'm not a mathematician, but I guess the, that illness and six months of strictures where I couldn't pee every few weeks really made me look at everything around. And maybe I have a gift, I don't know. I saw a postcard once of alders by a stream and I said, that's Labrador. All you saw was the, the leaves with the branches bent a little that way because in the, in the winter the alders get knocked down by the ice when it's flooding. And I thought, don't be stupid, you know, don't be silly. How could, and I turned it over and it's Labrador. And I thought, there is something, a fingerprint almost, uh, that we, that's there, if you can read it or sense it. Not read it, it's not a conscious thing, it's subconscious. It's very animalistic, probably. Maybe my father being, father's being a trapper, trapper helped. I don't know. Um, you know, he would come home with the last batch that he caught, he would bring it home with the dog team. I'd go out to meet him. And he'd come in, the dogs would be yelping and happy to get home, you know, and get, get fed. And they were thirsty and tired. And then he'd, his next job was to skin, we had no fridge or anything. This is winter, though to skin those animals. You had to do that. You couldn't skin with your fingers freezing. You can't do it with mitts on. Couldn't do it out in the woodshed. So he'd do it up in the attic. And at that point, I was sleeping there. And uh, my brother slept across here, and I slept here, and the stairway was between, like that. You know, I saw the in innards. I saw the veins, the nerves, the skin pulled off, the musculature. And I've done a series of dead animals, roadkills. They're not, they're not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to sell them. But, you know, and there's a skinned rabbit. I, I purposely painted it. I found it dead, run over in town. One of my articles for Newfoundland Quarterly was about that, but roadkills. Here we are, you know, worried about wildlife, and we kill probably a million a year in Canada alone on the highways. You might hear the thump, you might not. It could be a butterfly. It could be anything. And, you know, we don't even think about that as the cost of doing travel. Um, anyway, I brought it home and skinned it. I thought, I'm, I'm going to, you know, and we, I catch the odd rabbit too, by snare. I know it's not very nice, but 
I, I, get a, I have a taste for rabbit in the winter and I go and catch some. The population is good. You know, they can, ha they can handle it, but it is strangulation, <laughs> so it's... Uh, the Indians would have catched them with a spring. The old timers, my grandfather, grandfathers, not my Saunders, but the other one, but would have caught them with a spring. They bend the sapling over, hitch it so it's very delicately hooked with a little piece of wood, toggle, and, and the, uh, it would be a string uh, low, uh, snare because it had no wire, no ready-made wire. But it was uh, heavy, um, heavier sud, sud line, they call it, which was for cod fishing, stiff. So, but the, if it, you know, they'll chew it off, so you, they spring. So the hair goes up in the air. It's strong enough to just whip them up in the air and they drive very quickly, right? It's just like hanging, basically. And then, and they're up off the ground where uh, the weasel can't catch it, or chew it, or a squirrel, or whatever. Yeah, that's another side, you know. Of being conscious, but it's not most people don't wouldn't admire that. Well, I you have the. I did a, a forest woman later down the road. Lori Sanderson asked me to do how to build a lean-to for her kids. They were boys. I think they were all boys. This group, 4 H forestry. So I built the lean-to, and I said, "No, okay. Luckily, hopefully, you've told someone." How, you know where you were going, so that someone might come looking for you, or a plane might fly over, all that, so you can build a fire. But you're hungry, so what are you going to do if you're here three or four days, you know, starving? You should have brought carried some snare wire, picture cord would would do, or brass wire. If you're going in the woods, you should have compass, but you should also have some snare wire. Would you like to know how to catch a rabbit? Oh yes, yeah, and she wanted that too, and we talked about compass too, so I'm. You know, put the stick in and put the sticks on either side, the right height, and made the snare the right size. And said, there. Now, but you should do that in a lead. Rabbits in the winter, when the snow gets over the steep, they tend to run in what we call leads, thoroughfares, streets. Put it in one of those. And they run at night and they run fast. They're not looking, you know, because there's owls up there and so on. So they're looking for something to nibble and then move on but they'll just run into it and you'll have a meal. You know, it's not so terrible. We, we kill anyway, we just don't know it. It comes gift wrapped, <laughs> it comes wrapped in foil or whatever, and, or in the supermarket, but we do, we do still eat meat. Well, we kill by remote control there, yeah. right? And, yeah. Uh, which is in a sense much worse. Much worse. Much nastier. Wartime too, you know, it used to be close up. Mm. Now it's drones, mm. you know, mm. it's, Yes, and it removes your sense of engagement with it and your sense of with the reality real of it. Human and being. Yeah, yeah. And so that, you know, the armist, uh, what was it, Christ Christmas in World War I, the Germans, uh, they came out of their trenches and said, to hell with this. You know, let's have uh, a drink and let's. Let's have one day of being human beings and not yeah. patriots, right? You yeah. Know? yeah. You talk about the typography of the animals in one of the books. And it's the tracks, it's the way that you... Oh, that typography, you as, that's in um, Alder Music. It's in Alder Music, about yeah. About the okay. typography yeah. on the snow in the morning when you yeah. go out in fresh fallen snow and look at chickadee track there, or on top of the stump, there's chickadee, there's a squirrel going somewhere, and there's a deer, right? Dragging his feet through the snow because it's deep. Yeah, typography. Well, I, I'm very interested in typography. and. You know, as an editor of two or three magazines or publications at Lands and Forests, that's where I got interest. I got a book on where all the Garamond and Sans Serif and Serif and all these bold faces and so on came from. You know, all these people who invented them. And I thought, that's amazing, you know, that they would say, okay, how will we make an A in this new system or a B and do it? So I had a book and I lent it and never got it back. Um, but I was, yeah, I didn't have much control over what typography, what fonts we used and what size and so on in those magazines. But I, I just got interested because, you, you, you know, kerning, where you make the letters come out flush right, mm -hmm. you have to do a little squeeze and spread with different letters. I found that fascinating. That, that, uh, and I w almost wish I had that book again, but, but I have, I, I got some books from Studio Vista in England, London. Um, 
they were up there, but I've, I think I'll give them to Gaspro as part of their library. But the typography was called of the different kinds of letters. Another one was illustration. Well, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating image to use for the tracks in the snow, that they, the yeah. animals are, in a sense, typing their stories Yeah, it fascinated feet, me. Right? Yeah. 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 These things come and you, you think, ah, good, I, you know, I wouldn't, how did I think of that? Or why didn't I, you know, or I see somebody else's writing, I say, why didn't I think of that? But you can't copy them, it has to come to you, it has to be yours. But if you're writing what you love about, you write lovingly, and lovingly, is intimate and you call on your best you call up your best for your love lover or your loving portrait i guess you don't want to think about it too much because you don't want to be it's like c.s lewis about says about faith you know it gives you a, a, a lift off to to come to to realize something but you don't want to seek for that that thrill. You don't go looking for the thrill. That's not true religion. It comes to you out of the blue. Right? About three years ago, yeah, three years ago, uh, that book came out, My Stroke of Insight, about having a neurosurgeon in New York, I think, had a stroke, felt it coming on, knew what it was. Yeah. And I had the book out of the library, but I don't have it now. And her mother, wise woman that she was, she said, she wouldn't have thought of it. No one had really done that. His mo her mother took her, treated her as a baby again, took her in bed with her, snuggled, loved, held her. She said, that speeded up my recovery amazingly. That's not her literal words, but that... That's where I was. I was a baby. I couldn't talk. I couldn't find myself outside. I had to learn it all again. But she said, because of her wisdom or intuition, she took me in the bed as a baby, and that really speeded up my recovery, she figured. That's, that's what I took from it. Anyway. And the other thing was I was reading about, you know, brains are not rigid. You, old dogs can learn new tricks. The brain is plastic. It's hungry for to learn things. It's hungry for challenge. I thought, I've got that guitar there behind the TV. It's been there for 25 years. I write about it in Red Spruce. Ever since the kids grew up and flew away, I used to sing Newfoundland folk songs. Suki's boat is painted green. Aha, my boy, me boys, me boys. Uh, but I don't use it anymore. So I got kind of ashamed looking at it in this case and took it out. I had taken a bit of classical music. I never studied music uh, when I'm in my 40s. Not for the brain then, just because I love classical music, classical guitar, Fernando Sor, you know, and all those guys, cruelly. And I took it out and put it in the proper position. You know, you, you put one foot up and put my fingers on and, and some music book fell out and I flipped through, those are some I had done with Karen Henniger in Toro in my 40s. Okay, we'll try that one. Fernando Sora. Fairly simple. If the page is black, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> As one of my kids put it. Two of them are musicians. Anyway, two girls. But uh, my fingers remembered. My brain, the pattern was there. I looked at these, you know, I can't, I have to count to see F A C E. Okay, that's an A. That I can't. I don't need to do that. My fingers remembered the patterns for that, line by line, and I thought, "Wow, I'm not that smart," but the, you know, my brain still has it. So I'm I'm going to go take lessons again. I'll never be good, but you know, they said music is one of the best, and language is probably better for your brain as you age. You know, uh, it, it it thrives on challenge. I'm up here doing nothing right now. You're just doing the same thing over and over. Like the guy that, what do you do? Working the locks, say, eh, at St. Peter's. You do it over and over. Or there was another one I heard about, some similar. He did that in a sawmill. For, from the time he was 16 to the time he was 65 or 70, he did the same thing over and over. Shifted the carriage, I think, or something. Very repetition. 
What would you think about at home? Or what would you talk about? How could you do that? On the other hand, you might be perfectly free to think of everything once you got good at it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Everything else. You yeah. know, like Dali, when he was painting, would put on music or something to distract him just enough so that he wasn't thinking too much, mm -hmm. right? And then you would get these marvelous uh, surrealism. You know. I asked my father once, I said, Dad, what's it like to go up and down the river, two and a half mile, uh, hour trip with the outboard motor humming away, slow, five horsepower Johnson, you know, very slow, heavy canoe. What's it like? What was it like for you to go up and down the river? What did you think about? Oh, he said, I think about the water, the rocks on the bottom, the uh, freshwater grass that grows in the river, the trees, the reflection, the sound of the motor going under the trees. I remember all that too. Under the trees where they hang o overhang the channel, the motor gets echoey, eh? like in a cathedral for a little while. And then you come out in the open and it's gone. You know? Um, or when I was doing Dr. Olds, I wanted to interview this guy who ran the hospital boat all over these 110 communities that it serviced, taking x-rays, pulling teeth. They came to our place too. We couldn't get a dentist any other way. You know, I lost a lot of teeth because I like sugar. I said, I'd like to interview about, you know, your what, things. You must have seen so many different things, whales and so on. You must have been through storms. That's what I want to talk about. Oh, he said, no, I don't think. My son, he said, I don't think uh, I want to be interviewed. He said, we we just done our job. I didn't get that interview. <laughs> <laughs> it was not in the book. I got yeah. others, lots yeah. of others. Yeah. You know, I taped them and I transcribed them. I got Canada Council grant that gave me two months, one month to record and, and travel around and catch all the patients I could who were still living and the doctors who were still living, colleagues. And he was gone by then. But when we came out, I interviewed him for the chapter in Rattles and Steadies about my father. It's my father's memoir. I don't know if you know that one. No, I don't it's uh, River Man, The River Man, or uh, My Life. Uh, Dr. Olds loved to go hunting moose and caribou, and Dad was usually his guide. And so I thought, I've got to get those two together. So I got them together. They were like two roosters. He said, he said to my father, Bit, I thought you were taller than that. He was taller. He was fairly tall, skinny, Dr. Olds. Anyway, I got them there, and, and they talked, and I just listened. And when I came out, I said to my son, who ran the tape recorder, Danny, who was about 16, you know what? Your mother doesn't want me to do another book, because I had done Rattles, Rattles and Steadies. No, yeah, I was doing Rattles and Steadies, but she was getting tired of it. She said, I'm sick and tired of living with your father. <laughs> So I'm getting really into it, you know. I'm telling, the book was written in his words, first person. So I had to get into it. And naturally, she got tired of it after a while, before I got to the end of it. But I said to Danny, going down the steps, Danny, I know she's not too happy about that book, but I think I have to write another book about this guy. Mm -hmm. And that happened about five years later. But I'm not a writer, I'm a painter. My wife said, you know, I get tired of all this writing, she said. You're, you know, sitting at the computer, you're at it for hours, especially toward the end. You're not here. She said, damn it, I married a painter, not a writer. I keep that in mind. And I have two book ideas now. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, I told that story to some kids. I was doing Writers in the Schools for Writers Federation one time. I forget where I was. Newfoundland, I think. And he said, what's it like to be a writer, Mr. Saunders? And I said, I'll tell you. And that story I told him about how, you know, if you write another book like that, she said, I'll leave you. So I said, that's what she said. And I'm debating it right now. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she really meant it. <laughs> and this one, someone said last year, I hear Gary is writing another book. What's it about? She said, about his last. <laughs> She's Scottish background. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, okay. She okay. keeps me grounded. Yeah. Gary Saunders, painter, forester, educator, author. 
Some of the others we've interviewed have a comparably deep relationship with particular places. Edmund Matachewaban, for example, on James Bay, or Santiago Manuel Valera, who defended his people's ancestral terrain in the Peruvian Amazon and took eight bullets in the process. And here's an update. When we interviewed him in 2014, Santiago was facing charges of instigation of homicide, but in 2016, he was acquitted. Commitment to place? Eight bullets? Oh yeah. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron.